Well, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the first event in the 2020 Glen Storytelling Festival, which, as you can probably realize, is going to be very different from the event we planned. We um, are hosting virtual events all over the weekend. Uh, it's my time. I'm going to mention a couple of our funders, and then I'm going to let Jamie talk about another one. But it's our time to thank the funders this year. We're very, very grateful to Midney Santrum Borough Council, who held faith with us and gave us a grant towards the festival. And if you follow the Glen Storytelling Festival Facebook page, the Mayor, Councillor Peter Johnson, has done a really terrific, warm-hearted welcome. So I'm very grateful for that. We're also got some funding from the Honourable the Irish Society, a very old organisation based in Coleraine. We've also some funding, which we got early in the year from the National Lottery Community's 25 year fund. And then our other sponsor we're very grateful to, and Jamie will have to take the spotlight back for this, is the Causeway Coast and Glens Heritage Trust. And before Jamie speaks, I just want to say that probably without the support of uh, Jamie, Jamie Laverty that you're gonna hear next, we probably wouldn't have got this show on the road at all. So I'm gonna hand over to you, Jamie, just to say a word, and then if you throw it back to me again, thank you. Okay. Evening everybody, um, for anybody that doesn't know me, I'm Jamie and I work at Cosby Christian Glen's Heritage. It's so important, um, it's part of our cultural heritage and part of what we as the Trust want to support and see continue. Um, and it's a real honour to work with Liz. She said without me, without Liz none of this would be possible. Um, and without the amazing storytellers, I might be slightly biased, but the best storytellers that we have here in the Glens that are just absolutely fantastic that's what makes this festival it's the people it's the stories it's the landscape that gives to the stories so without all of that mixture of everything this wouldn't be possible um and i just am so grateful to be part of it um my boss is in this evening so i just want to see if Teresa is listening um you're muted i don't know if you want to jump in and add anything to that or if you're happy enough Jimmy, happy, happy enough. Uh, well done to you and Liz. You have genuinely pulled this out of the bag um, in what are exceptional circumstances. And, and all the storytellers bring their passion, their connectivity with the landscape. And through the Heart of the Glens Landscape Partnership, we were able to support the storytelling. But these guys have taken wings and they have flown um, and they continue to connect, have fun, tell us stories with moral guidance i just can't wait until i hear all of all of the unravelings over the weekend so we're glued in here in fermanagh um and the best of luck thanks very much thank you very much indeed um we have people joining us all the time here please put in the chat if you haven't already where you're joining us from uh we have got russia we've got hungary we've got canada united states czech republic germany um england scotland Orkney up there all by itself, uh, lots of different places, so please put in where you're from. So what we're going to do, in a normal story swap, oh, you put names in the hat and you pull them out. This is a bit of a biased story swap because this is our introduction to the weekend. This year we decided we've got our featured tellers are in the audience. We've got Maria, uh, Maria Watton and Dougie Mackay, and we're going to get a story from each of them because they can't be here in person. Uh, as I say, Kate Corker should be coming in at some stage from Spain where she is at the minute but we're going to give pride of place to our local tellers just so you can see who you're going to hear over the weekend. What we've done is pre-record the stories. A big concert tomorrow night we'll talk to you more about that we'll get on with the stories but I wondered Kieran um, Mulholland would you start us off maybe with the Blue Hills of Antrim because that's where we are and tonight there's a clear moon out there so it'll be pretty blue looking. Thank you Liz. I'll uh, play the, the air known as the Blue Hills of Antrim.
lovely, Karen. That gets us off to a good start. Thank you very much. The good thing, the good thing about um, this festival, when we're out and about, we're actually going to um, have music and stories set in the landscape, and uh, you'll hear Karen playing that out of doors, so it should be really rather nice. So actually, I'm going to in, uh, head over to Donegal now. Karen Edwards is in Oi Island, and we thought we'd kick off. She wasn't able to come and join us for the rest of the filming, but she's here with us tonight. And I'm wondering, Karen, if you would share a story with us. Certainly will, Liz. Thank you very much. And I'm just sorry that I can't, we all can't be together tonight, but isn't this wonderful that we can join through virtual storytelling? And I'm sitting in the old post office house on Nui Island with the original post box behind me. And I'm just delighted to be part of this. And thank you for inviting me to tell a story. The story that I'm going to tell tonight is one that I would usually tell with older people and people who experience dementia. And I find that it, it helps to uplift them, them and their carers. So I hope you enjoy it. There was a farmer called Willie. And he lived in Ockafatton, up the back of Carnlock, up in the glens. He was sort of a small scale farmer. He had a couple of ducks, a couple of geese, a couple of cows, nothing very major. He didn't bother with crops or anything like that. And Willie wasn't terribly well educated. He could just about write his name and he definitely couldn't read. But life was tough in those days. It was during the war. As well as that, Willie wasn't married, so he had to do all his chores on the farm. And when he came in at night, he had to make his own dinner. He had nobody to help him. And in addition, there was an organization called the Milk Marketing Board, which many of you will be familiar with. And they were very strict. And if they weren't going to buy your produce, they would send out a letter. At the bottom of that letter would be a series of tick boxes. And whatever reason for not buying the goods would be ticked. Well... One of these letters had landed on Willie's mat. And of course he couldn't read it. So he went out into the lane by the house up at Off of Fatten, and he ran into his neighbour, Maud Manili, who gave me this story. And he says, Maud, could you give me a hand to read this letter? I surely, Willie, give it here, give it here. And Maud looked at the letter and oh, shook her head. Willie, it says here, they're not going to buy your milk. There's a foreign body in it. A foreign body? And under God, could there be a foreign body in my milk? Oh, Willie, sure, a foreign body could be the tiniest wee step speck of dirt or a, a little hair. That, that's enough to put them off. <laughs> Willie laughed. He wasn't best pleased, but at least he was content to know the reason why they weren't going to buy his milk. And he had a great sense of humour. Because the next day, one of the neighbours says to Willie, Hey, Willie, have you any idea where the Germans are today? No, uh, but there was one of them in my milk churn yesterday. Well, the neighbours decided that the best thing they could do for Willie to make his life a bit easier was to get him married. And to that end, they got him all dolled up. They put a good tweed suit on him. They got his hair brushed, his face shone, shoes the works. And they took him off to the dance in Ballymena. Well, as you know, in those days, the dance halls were all the women down one side, all the men down the other, and there the twain shall meet till nearly the end of the night. But Willie went in and his eyes immediately lit on a wee girl in the centre who was from Belfast. He asked her to dance and the two of them headed off really well. The neighbours, they were raging. Willie, she not do. You need a big strong lock of a country lass. She's far too thin. Well, Willie was having none of it. He stuck with a Belfast girl, he danced with her all night, he walked her home, and before too long, the subject of matrimony had arisen. The two ideas of a wedding were very different. Willie thought you could go and tie the knot and it would take about 10 minutes and everything would be done. You'd be back on the farm doing your chores, all sorted. But the Belfast girl had a very different idea. What she was interested in was, would there be a good do? And I mean a really good do. Hotel that works, no expense spared. She was also interested to know, would there be a honeymoon? Now, Willie knew about the full moon and he knew about the harvest moon. And he'd even heard tell of the new moon, but this 
honeymoon was baffling him. And he sort of scratched his head and thought about it and then thought, I'm not going to worry. It'll sort itself out. And one night he was coming back from the Fair Hill Market in Ballymena. And there up in the sky was the most beautiful orange disc of a moon. It's just the harvest moon she means. It's just the fancy talk of those Belfast ones. We can sort that. So the wedding was all organized. The hotel was booked. The bridesmaids were sorted, the best man, and the day of the wedding dawn. The best man called at the farm for Willie. Hey Willie, are you there? No sign of Willie. He went out to the bar where the cows were. Willie, where are you? Still no sign of Willie. He looked down in the bottom field. There wasn't a trace. He came back up to the house and he was just about to give up and go on when he, he heard a sort of a, a thistle down in the bottom room. He went down. There was Willie, hiding under the bed. Will you get out here now? You're going to marry that wee girl from Belfast and that's all there is to it. You're not going to let her down. He trailed Willie out. He got him dressed, took him off to the wedding and everything went according to plan. The bride was delighted. The hotel was spectacular. The, the dinner was to die for. It was just all a breeze. Poor Willie. Thought he did easier days digging turf in the bog than this wedding malarkey, but he just wanted to get home. But the evening wore on, they got through the speeches, and it was time to go. And the couple set off for the farm. Now the bride, although she'd had a good day, she was a wee bit disappointed that there was no mention of the honeymoon. But she thought, I'll not rock the boat. I've had a great day. It'll sort itself out. So the two of them arrived home, and before they could settle for the night, Willie had his chores to do. Off he went to feed the animals, get everything ready, back in, and then it was time for bed. Up the stairs they went. She in one side of the bed, he in the other. He was exhausted. He was just dozing off with the next thing. Hey, Willie, I'm cold. Oh, now hold on a minute, Mary. Just, just wait there. I have a spare blanket in the dresser. And he went over to the dresser. He got the blanket out. He tucked it in under her feet and patted her down. Went back in round the side of the bed and got in and lay down again. Dozing off. Willie, Willie, I'm still cold. Now, Mary, just, just, just wait there a minute. And he was very good. He didn't let his impatience show one iota. Down the stairs he went fixed a roasting hot water bottle, brought it back up, tucked it in under her feet, patted her in, blanket, everything, into the bed for the third time. Shattered he was. He'd never been as tired in his life. He lay down and he was just in that twilight zone between waking and sleeping when, well, I'm still cold. And when I was cold at home, my mummy used to give me a hug. Mary. I don't mind getting you a spare blanket from the dresser and I don't mind getting you a hot water bottle, but I am not going to Belfast tonight for your mother. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Thanks very much indeed. I love that story. Thank you very much. That's great. Uh, from Oi Island, we'll go a bit closer to where Karen normally resides. Uh, she normally lives in Carnlough. We're going up to Glenarm. We're going up the Glen a bit to Colin Irwin. Um, people who regularly listen to our storytelling on a Saturday night would know that Colin creates many of his stories and many of them sound as though they've been there for years and years and years, but uh, he's very good at composing his own stories. So would you please welcome Colin Irwin. Thank you. I think I'm unmuted. It's lovely, lovely to be here. Such a shame that we cannot all be here in person together tonight, but this is, uh, this is the best we can do under the circumstances. And uh, I am delighted, absolutely uh, delighted and honoured to be here and such uh, company as well. I can see a lot of uh, famous names and faces there. Anyway, I'm going to tell you a story that uh, is uh, set down in the, the glens of Antrim in a place called Bally Yemen. Many of you will have heard of this place because there is another lady here tonight lives there, of course, Liz Weir. But anyway, I'm going to tell you about another very wise woman who came from Bally Yemen. And uh, once upon a time, I want to show you some things. I, I have a great fascination for things, all kinds of things, but particularly old things. And once upon a time, people believed that a Stone Age axe head found at the foot of Teve Bulia 
the most striking hill in the glens of Antrim was a thunderbolt come to earth. And they knew that the best time to find these was nine days after the storm that delivered them to the ground. And these, of course, were imbued with great power. And likewise, elf shots. Have you ever heard of elf shots? Elf shots were turned up by farmers' plows. And people knew that these were all that remained of darts fired by malevolent fairies. And they too were imbued with great magic and power. In the wrong hands, in the wrong hands, they could wreak havoc. But in the hands of a virtuous, wise woman, they, their, their power for good and healing was infinite. You see, it's not so many years ago that people the length and breadth of the country relied heavily on the knowledge and the skill and the good judgment of wise women or hen wives, as they were sometimes known, mana fasa in Irish. And their wisdom was handed down through the generations, mother to daughter, mother to daughter. They brought babies into the world. They saw corpses out into the next. And they were also often consulted on um, matters of delicate intimacy. But we'll not talk about that tonight. The wise women were revered. They were feared sometimes. And very occasionally, they were uh, maligned as witches. And this very thing happened to this poor wise woman in Bali Yemen, who lived in the shadow of T. Bulya. And how she fell so low in the estimation of her neighbors when once she had been held so high was down to one man alone. That man was the parish priest. He was a young blue-in from Belfast, and he had no time whatsoever for what he considered to be satanic practices. They must cease forthwith, he demanded from the pulpit. Put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Light a candle in the chapel. Uh, make a small donation of a copper or two. And for all other temporal matters, I'm sure the new doctor in the village will be only too happy to offer his services. But these satanic practices must cease forthwith. Well, the people still believe deep in their hearts. They believed in the power of the old folk cures and remedies. But they were swayed against this woman. Overnight, she became an outcast. The people far too easily disremembered her cure for warts. The old cartwheel halfpenny placed on the growth and the insistence of no payment and not a single word of thanks uttered. They forgot about her ointments and poultices that cured everything from the toothache to a boil. They forgot about her infusions of wild herbs and the tonics that she used for everything from constipation to infertility. The rare and treasured lightning bolt passed down for generations to mother to daughter and used to ease the terrible pain of birth, labor pains, suddenly was of no worth. The people believed the priest when he said it was just a stone fashioned into a tool by the earliest people of Ireland. The elf shots released their power when they were boiled with certain herbs and they were taken to stimulate the flow of breast milk. 
And all of a sudden, they were valueless. The priest said, they were just the tips of arrows fired by some ancient hunter long, long ago. Interesting as they were to an antiquarian, they had no more power than a pebble found on the beach. So the people put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and they lit candles in the chapel and they made offerings of halfpennies and pennies, money they could ill afford. And their purse could not stretch to a doctor's bill. And so warts went uncured. Toothaches tormented people. There was no one to call in the middle of the night when there was a difficulty with a cow and calf or a mare and foal. Fevers took children and babies were born still. The people began to despise the wise woman of Balayimen. They said she was in cahoots with the wee folk. They even said she consorted with Old Nick himself. No one seemed to notice that for all her supernatural connections, she was just as poor as they were. For all her evil powers, she was no better off. And yet the people still persecuted her. She was openly mocked and condemned as a witch. The priest said she must repent and mend her ungodly ways. She told him to go to hell. But one night, the thatch of her cottage was set alight. She and her family had to flee into the darkness and they never returned to their wee townland cottage in the shadow of T. Bullia. Some said they emigrated to America. Some said England. Some said they saw her at the Lammas Fair selling uh, trinkets and cough bottles. Her friends and her relations never talked of her again because they feared that they would bring trouble to their own doorstep. And so the story of the Glen Ballyeman wise woman accused of being a witch faded and was forgotten. But time passes and three or maybe four generations later, a young woman returned to the wallsteads of her ancestral home. The story of the wise woman had survived in her family, passed down from mother to daughter, down through the generations to the present day. She stood there and closed her eyes and imagined her grandmother in the kitchen of the cottage preparing her folk remedies, ancient remedies, with her herbs and her infusions. And that old cottage had long since tumbled down after having the roof burned off it. But there was a byre close by where the animals were kept and it was not burned. The thatch had long since fallen in. It had been replaced over the years by slates and then a corrugated iron roof. But the building was more or less as it had been. And the young woman entered without fear. Bats and swallows flew out from the rafters over her head. But she put her hand up along the top of the stone wall and she felt in between the rafters because it had been whispered down through the generations that the tools of her ancestors' trade were kept in the byre because their power and their magic was so great that they could not be kept in a dwelling house where people slept. Years and years of decayed thatch and mortar dust and rats' nests and spiders' webs did not put the young woman off. And eventually she found a calico parcel and she opened it up. And inside, she found a Stone Age axe. 
that her ancestor believed to be a thunderbolt. She found flint arrowheads plowed up by a farmer many years before and believed to be elf shot. And she found the old copper penny dated 1797, the old cure for warts. The magic of these things was not diminished in the glare of understanding. The young woman took them home and she keeps them with her most treasured possessions. They are in a box beside her bed. Along with her diplomas in aromatherapy and homeopathy and the certificates that tell the modern world that she is a fully qualified nurse and midwife. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Thank you so much indeed. Um, I love that story. Love that story. Thank you. Ah, when, I, when Colin told me the story is called The Wise Woman of Valium and I knew it couldn't be about me because I'm not half wise half the time. But anyway, thank you very much. So Colin and Karen are going to contribute stories over the weekend. Karen, well, they're all recorded. But we were supposed to have our guest storytellers who come and join us every year. And this year, all three of our guest storytellers are with us tonight. And I'm going to call them one at a time. First of all, I'm going over to Staffordshire to Maria Watton, who might give us a greeting and might give us just a story there, Maria. Are you there? I'm hoping so. There she is. I'll just get you unmuted. Still not unmuted. No, nope. glasses on. I just knew it. She's like myself. <laughs> Welcome, Maria. How are you? I'm grand, thank you, Liz. I'm just gonna get, just gonna get rid of the grand. Oh, great! I can I can take my glasses off now. <laughs> it's so good to see you all, and I'm so sorry that we can't be together tonight, face to face, eye to eye, heart to heart. But we're here and I do have a story for you and when I do get over to see you all I'm going to give each and every one of you a big hug <laughs> um, and I hope that's next year and I think that's why um, I want to tell you this story that's really in my mind tonight because right now I probably would have been crossing the waters to see you. <clears throat> there was once an island in the middle of the sea, a little rocky island. Not one blade of grass grew on that island. And so the islanders had to fish and the fishermen would take their catch across to the mainland and they'd exchange the fish for everything that was required on the island to live. And they would bring back all the goods and the people would be excited when they came back. Now one day, the fishermen were about to set off, but one of them was sick, was ill. And so one fisherman ran home and said to his little girl, I know you've always wanted to go across to the mainland. The space on the boat, would you like to come? The little girl said, yes, daddy, yes. And off she went. And the boat sailed through the waters and reached the mainland. She was so excited. I have to go and do business, said her father. But the market is over there. Go and look at it. Enjoy yourself. And so the little girl went to the market. She couldn't believe her eyes. She was used to a little rocky, craggy island. But here was the fruit market, abundant with pears and crisp apples and plums and damsons. One of the ladies offered her a damson. She ate it and the juice ran onto her chin and she was smiling. And then as she walked a little further into the marketplace, she came to the part of the market 
that was full of clothes. She looked down at her own tatty gray dress and her black boots and her worn down heels. And she saw a stall. And there hanging was a little satin pink dress and little satin slippers. And there was a long mirror and she went to that store and she picked up the dress and she placed it next to herself and she looked in the mirror and the lady said to her, why don't you try on those slippers? She took off her boots and she put on the slippers. They were so soft and she looked at herself and she had to take them back off again and and she said goodbye and carried on through the market. It was the smell that drew her in because of the fragrance. Because next she came to the flower market. There were tall yellow sunflowers, gardenia, tulips, and then roses, pink roses, butter yellow roses white roses. When she touched those petals, they were like velvet. We have to go. It was her father. We have to go right now. She turned, she ran, she got back in the boat, sharing it with the sl slippery fish and that were left and all the goods that they brought from the mainland. And back over the waves, they went to their little island. The following week, her father looked at his little girl and he said, I know you'd like to come back with me. I can't take you. There's no room in the boat, but what would you like? What would you like me to fetch back for you? Now, you may think that you would ask for the little pink satin dress or those lovely little pink slippers, but no. She said, Father, fetch me dirt. Father, bring me soil, bring me earth. And so the fisherman, strange request, went off. And sure enough, when he returned, he put his hands in both of his pockets and pulled out two handfuls of dirt of earth and laid two little hills of soil on the kitchen table. That is what you asked for the next week. I'll fetch something back for you. What would you like? Dirt, earth, soil. The week after that, Father, I want dirt, earth, soil. The week after that, Father, fetch me a sapling. The little girl took the soil and she went to the church. The church had been hewn out of the rock. Next to the door, there was a little crevice, which at one point had held like a cup, the holy water where people would bless themselves as they went into mass. But it hadn't been used for a long time. Now the girl took the earth, pressed it down. Now the girl took the sapling and put it in the soil. Every day she tended that sapling, watering it, pruning it. Time passed. After the first year, one white rose grew. Second year, two white roses, three years, and three white roses were growing. Now, when the people came into mass, they'd smell the roses as they came in. An envoy was sent from the mainland. He arrived on a grand boat and then <clears throat> told the people there was a new queen. The old king had died on the mainland and the new queen wanted to come and visit. She wanted to come and shake every single person in her kingdom by the hand and she would be coming shortly. But for now, he wanted to look around the island and, um, and, and, and tell them the protocol for when the queen arrived. They took him around the island. Very good, he said, and he was just about to leave when he turned to them all and said, and of course, it is protocol that when the queen leaves, 
you will present her with a bouquet of flowers. Well, they all looked at each other because, of course, the only flowers, the only growth on the whole island were those three white roses that that little girl had spent so long nurturing and growing. The envoy left and the inhabitants of the island didn't even speak about it. When the queen came the following week, she was graceful. She was kind, she was gentle, her voice was low. She held each person's hand on that island and she even went and prayed with them all in the little church. The priest did not speak. There was not one sound, nobody muttered. There was silence. And in that silence, the people could feel her prayer. It was not for herself, it was for them. When she left and vowed to return, the people from the island began to look at each other twitching because they knew, they knew the protocol. Just at that moment, the little girl came holding three white roses and gave them to the queen. She left. You know, that winter was a cruel winter, an iron winter, but the men still had to go out fishing. And one day, all the fishermen went out. And before long, there was a great storm all day they watched. The waves were as high as church steeples and they were crashing down like ruins and the men did not return. All the women and the children stood on the edge of the island looking out anxiously. It began to grow dark. And then the mist fell and they could see nothing. And it was late and they all turned and went home, all except for the little girl. She waited all alone, wrapped in the mist. Eric. And then the fog began to lift. And all she could see was darkness. She thought she might just go home. She thought of her father, how much she loved him. And then she felt it. Something touched her cheek. She looked up into the sky. It was snowing. It's snowing. And then she looked again. Falling from the sky were white rose petals. Hundreds and hundreds of white rose petals and she looked across into the sea and as the white rose petals fell they formed a bridge and in the distance she saw a shadow and the shadow began to define itself and walking across that bridge of rose petals were all the fishermen and right at the front was the little girl's father with his arms open, smiling at her. They had come home. Oh, beautiful. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Maria. Gorgeous story, thank you. Ah, it's one of those stories just one. Huh. Now, as you may have seen, we've been having greetings from all around the world uh, over the last few days from people who've been to the festival before. So I thought it'd be fun to include a few of those people. So we're going to go over to Switzerland now to my former intern, storyteller, musician, uh, Isabel Hauser. Isabel, would you like to say hello to the folks here? Maybe play as a tune. 
Hello everyone from Switzerland. I cannot believe that this time last year I was in Ireland at the Glens of Antrim Storytelling Festival in person this year. Well, you know what the situation is, but I'm so happy to be here tonight and have this story and music swap with just told me, uh, told us, brought to mind um, a tune that I like to call my happy ever after tune and um, it's called Inishir. So it's related to an island. It's um, related to the sea and yeah. So here it is. I hope you enjoy. just beautiful just beautiful thank you very much indeed thank you thank you thank you so much that was lovely do you know where we're going to go now this is sort of a world tour we're going to go to spain because one of our featured tellers when she wasn't coming here um is actually in a place in spain so kate corkery are you there can you unmute yourself i haven't seen you for such a long time i'm here um, oh good where are you I'm in Spain. Can you see me? Not yet, but I'm hoping to see you soon. Oh, there you are. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Hola, como esta? Muy bien, gracias. Um, circumstances have brought me to Spain until very early tomorrow morning. And it is amazing to be here. It's 30 degrees, uh, very warm. And I'm in the warm home of my friend, Anna. Mm -hmm. Um, and Anna lives in a place uh, uh, in Malaga called um, La Cala de Moral. And in La Cala de Moral, all the time I've come here, you arrive at Anna's house by passing through an avenue lined with beautiful mulberry trees. And the sad thing that has happened a day or so ago, the council, in their wisdom, decided to cut down 83 beautiful, healthy, mulberry trees. So Anna and a lot of people have, have objected and protested and it's a big, very worthy cause. And we were thinking about what these trees meant to the community um, and everybody who, who, who comes to this place. These beautiful big trees not only give shelter, they give oxygen, they give protection from the sun. Uh, today in 30 degrees it's sweltering because the trees are gone. The lady who used to sell lottery uh, tickets, she's now out in the blistering sun with a small umbrella and not under a mulberry tree. So it's very upsetting. And one of the people who has been uh, helping the cause spoke of, on a video the other day about what these mulberry trees meant to him and the, his memory and his tradition of his family. And he remembered as a child, and apparently a lot of people here, including Anna's family, when they were little, 
um, they were given a little box and in the box they were given silkworm eggs and these little silkworm eggs were to be fed and nurtured by the leaves from the mulberry trees so the children every day would put in fresh leaves and over time the eggs would hatch and the caterpillars would eat the leaves and over time the caterpillars having eaten lots of healthy fresh green mulberry leaves they would then uh, make the cocoons and of course that's what the silk was made from and because this was introduced in the time of, of the Moors and it was forbidden for the local Spanish poor people to, to have the luxury of silk. I've got a piece of silk skirt here which is very nice. Many, many silkworms worked hard to make that but they were not uh, allowed because it was meant to be a luxurious um, uh, material. So it was in secret that the mothers handed this tradition down to their children. So within the houses, many little children were there cultivating and nurturing the silkworms, not to make the silk, but uh, until the point where the butterfly opens out and comes out of the cocoon and flies away and is free. So I thought I'd share that with you because it's something I didn't know till yesterday. And I was thinking of how everywhere in the world we pass on our, our, our traditions from, from the land that we come from. And when Maria spoke of the gift that was asked for was fistfuls of land to grow something, it really struck a chord because it's, it's so deep. Um, and also when Colin was talking about passing on, you know, the, the, the cures, the beliefs, the gifts we have in, in our stories and in our songs and in our cures, I wanted to share a little story from Andalusia that I had thankfully already heard um, and it's my gift to you from here until I can meet you all in person please God very soon. So this story is set in a village in Andalusia and there is a little girl Margarita and she lives with her mama and they're very poor but they're happy because mama loves Mar Margarita and she teaches her many things like how to cultivate silkworms and she teaches her songs and stories and little Margarita is a good child and she helps her mum every day never complains and she doesn't complain when every day she has to go down the hill and carry a, um, a bucket uh, a jug to to the well to fill it with water because of course they didn't have running water but Margarita every day without complaining would, would carry the jug down the hill to the well in the center of the village and every day she would grab the handle where the bucket was hanging and she'd lower the bucket and squeaky wheel down into the well and fill the bucket with water and then she would even though she was small and thin little girl she wound that rope back up and when the bucket was up she would pour the water into the jug and then she would carry that jug back up home on her head. Did that every day, but she didn't complain. She did it often singing and humming to herself because she had a beautiful voice and her mommy had told her, taught her lots of little songs. And one day it was really hot. It must've been as hot as today. And they were about to have a siesta, um, but Margarita hadn't yet got the water and her mommy said, please, can you, can you get the water? And she said, okay, mama, you sleep and I'll, I'll get the water um, and, and come back soon. Um, and her mother looked at her and said, Margarita, it's your birthday soon. And you're such a good girl. I, I want to give you something really special. In fact, I'm going to show it to you now. And Margarita's mommy went to the bedroom and under the bed there was a box and in the box, there was a little bracelet. Now, I'm sure it was prettier than this bracelet. I'm not quite sure what it was like, but it was precious to them because it was Margarita's father who had given it to the mother and he had got it from his mother and he had now passed away. And she said, Margarita, this is my most precious possession, but my darling, you deserve it. I want to give it to you. Margarita said, Mama, oh, gracias, Mama. Oh, it's, it's so beautiful, Mama. I will treasure this. I will wear it every day. I will mind it. Thank you, gracias. Thank you. Thank you. 
So from then on, and even from that day, Margarita put on this bracelet on her little wrist and she was happy to wear it as she took the jug down the hill towards the well for the water. But she was careful because she didn't want the bracelet to fall into the well. So she would always remember to take it off and put it on the wall while she was lowering the bucket down to fill it with water. And when she was winding it back up, and then she would put the water into the jug and she would put the bracelet back on her arm and she would carry the water back home. But one day when she was doing this and she was really tired because it was so hot, she went yet again to put the bracelet on the wall and to lower the bucket and to wind it back up and fill the jug with water. And she lifted the jug and she put it on her head and she turned for home. She had forgotten something. Oh, the bracelet. I left it on the wall of the well. So immediately she put down the jug and she ran back to get the bracelet. She could see it shining in the sun on the wall of the well. And she went to pick it up. But as her hand stretched out, <clears throat> her hand was grabbed by a big, strong hand with long, bony fingers. <laughs> it was an ogre. An old ogre disguised as a poor beggar man, dressed in a black cape with a big black hood. <laughs> now I have you, he said. Come to me, little girl who sings. And he pulled Margarita and he pushed her into a big black sack. He had already grabbed the bracelet and put it in his pocket. Aha! Now, my singing sack, you will sing for me. So he walked out of that village. He carried her in this black, stuffy black sack. And he carried her to the next village and under a tree, which probably was a mulberry tree. He called people. Come, everybody, come, come, come. I am a magician. I am going to do magic for you. Come and listen to my singing sack. My sack will sing for you. And then you can give me gifts, money, food, anything you wish. Come, listen. And he would nudge the sack with his elbow. Sing, singing sack, or I give you a whack. And out of the sack would come this little voice and this little song. Soy la única hija de mi mamá. Sola, muy sola, ella estará. Fui a fuente al agua de ayer. Ahora a mi casa no puedo regresar. And people were impressed that the sack could sing so well so they gave the ogre money and they gave him gifts and he was happy and he took everything greedily and he stuffed it in another sack and quickly moved out of that town to somewhere quiet where he could sit and eat and drink and laugh <laughs> very good very good very good sometimes he would remember to throw maybe a dry crust to margarita time went on Things were working well for the ogre. The magic sack was singing and he was getting everything he wanted. But back home, Margarita's mother was worried. Where had she gone? She had gone out to get the water. She hadn't come home. The jug was on the hillside, no sign of the child. She asked the neighbors, she asked friends, she searched, she looked, she prayed, she begged. There was no sign of her. She didn't return for days, for weeks. Margarita's mother sat by the fire like we're sitting now waiting, hoping, praying that her child was still alive. And one afternoon as she was sitting there, she heard a commotion in the town. She heard people gather. She heard a little song. She heard a little voice waft up the hill and the words in English were, I'm my mother's only daughter. Now she is alone, all alone, all alone. He sent me to fetch her the water. 
Now I can't get home, can't get home, can't get home. The mother heard the song. The mother heard the words. The mother heard the voice. She knew it was her daughter. When she ran down that hill and she saw the crowd gathered round the tree, she knew that in that black sack was her little girl. Oh, she felt like running up and attacking this big, tall, strong, fierce creature. But she knew she didn't have the strength. If she had a knife, she would have stabbed him, but she might have injured her daughter, so she didn't. She held back. She stayed calm. And when the crowd began to disperse, she went with a big smile on her face. Oh, senor, you must be so clever to teach a sack to sing like that. I would like to invite you to my house. I have food, I have wine, come be my guest. She invited him up the hill into our house. Sit down, sir, put down your sack. And she had some food that she presented to him. She gave him some wine, which he drank greedily. <laughs> And he drank some more and he drank quickly and he drank greedily and he ate greedily and soon he fell sleepy. The food, the wine, the heat, the welcome made him sleepy. So he began to slump back in the chair and soon his mouth was open, his lips were flapping in big snores. And while he was snoring loudly, Margarita's mother went quickly and she opened the sack and there was her little girl, thin and, and frightened, but alive. Oh, Margarita, Margarita, shh, say nothing. And she told her child to go and hide in the bedroom. And then she quickly went out the back of the house and she saw a sleeping cat, an old stray cat, an angry cat. But it was asleep and she lifted the cat and put it in the bag. She went to the front of the house and there was a sleeping dog, a stray dog who hated that sleeping cat. And she put the dog and the cat together into the sack and she tied the sack and went. <laughs> the ogre woke up with a jolt. She said, oh, senor, I'm glad you've had a siesta. And now I'm sure you would like to go on your way, on your interesting travels. Si. Si, senora, gracias por la comida. Um, okay, it's time for me to go. I will take my magic sack and leave. He picked up the sack, he put it on his back, he staggered out of the house, he staggered away from the village. He walked for some time because he was not hungry for a long time, his belly was full. But later that evening, because he was greedy, he decided it was time to ask for more. He put down the sack. He nudged it, sing, singing sack or I'll give you a whack. Of course it didn't sing. It squealed and it barked and it snapped and it scratched and it bit and it looked like the devil was in this sack. And the ogre got such a fright that the ogre ran and ran and ran and ran and ran and ran and was never seen again. He hasn't been seen to this day. I have certainly not seen him. Have you seen him, Anna? He has not been seen here ever since. But meanwhile, back in the house, Margarita's mother said, Margarita, darling, come. What made you put yourself in danger? How did you get taken away by this man in the sack? And Margarita said, but mommy, he was trying to take our most precious possession, the bracelet. And the mother said, Margarita, the bracelet was precious, but not our most precious possession. Our most precious possession is you and your safety. And it's the message we want to send our most precious possessions are ourselves and our stories and our trees and what we pass on and what we share. So I want to send you love and kisses from Andalusia. Gracias. Thank you, Kate. Thank you so much. And you know, uh, we're looking forward to next year when we'll have Maria and Kate and you're going to hear Dougie in a couple of uh, time, our three featured tellers. We've invited them back next year to honour our promise to them to come back to us again. But now we're going to go local. Uh, Stephen O'Hara lives down in Cushion Dunn. There's people all around the world salivating at the thought of Stephen's scones and his Florentines and Cafe Revive. Mm -hmm. um, many of his customers are on here watching tonight. Stephen, have you a story for us? I wanted to weave in the trees. Hey. Yeah, I thought I was getting feedback there from, I think, somebody else. Anyhow, 
Um, yes, I'm here to tell you tonight a story about something that we've all missed over this last few months, but it's maybe not what you'd think. It's not about haircuts or beauticians. It's not about foreign travel or about pubs. It's not about shielding or living in a bubble, but it's about something that has touched us all. And that's when we lose somebody. I think one of the biggest shocks back in March was learning that we were not going to be able to go to a funeral and we were not going to be able to go to a wake. Houses have been private. So I've written a, a story about wake customs in Ireland. And my wee disclaimer at the start is that this story is based in a rural Catholic community. Not every funeral in every part of our country is exactly the way I portray it here. But this is how things were done in my community in the past, when people were a lot more superstitious than we are today. So, on a morning in November in 1860, Joseph McKillop of Glenan woke up and jumped quickly out of his bed and looked at the clock. He saw it was seven o'clock. Good. He'd have time to get his work done before he had to go to the funeral. He went out and he brought in turf for the fire because his mother, who looked after his children, wasn't really fit to be doing much about the place. He fed the cows and then he remembered that his few sheep were down in the low field, on the field with no grass, because at that time of year, the east wind whipped up the glen and scorched the grass flat. So he also had uh, three children to get up and get dressed and washed. He didn't want the local people talking about him. The parish women would be very quick to say, oh, he's not looking after those wains. They're, they're very raggedy looking since Mary passed. You know, it's a new young wife that that man needs. But he wasn't going to have that. He had the children spick and span. And he did everything he could to keep everything right in the family. As he was moving the sheep, he looked across the glen to the corpse house, which is what they would have called a house where a funeral was about to take place. And he could just see smoke coming up from the chimney. And he realised everybody was up and about and he was doing a bit of calculating. He knew the funeral was at two o'clock and he knew that at one o'clock they'd be taking the corpse off the kitchen table and placing it into the coffin. And he knew that he had to be there before that happened because there was a particular thing happened in country houses. And that was, as soon as the corpse was put into the coffin, the tables had to be turned. Now we think we know today what turning the tables means. It means changing a situation to your own advantage. But in Ireland in the 19th century, turning the tables meant distressing the furniture in the house of the deceased. People would turn the table over, they would turn it upside down, the chairs would be knocked sideways, or they would carry out what they called breaking up the bed. And what that meant was that the bed had to be all the sheets and blankets torn off it, the mattress turned over, the bed stood on its edge. And the theory behind these two particular peshogs, which was the Gaelic word for superstitions, was that if they distressed the furniture in the corpse house sufficiently, then the next death to visit that family would not be on the same branch of the family. Now, since the funeral taking place was that of his brother-in-law, Joseph knew that if they turned the tables, that that could direct the next death in his direction. He couldn't afford to be losing a child, and he could not afford to be losing his mother. He'd already lost his wife, Mary, to consumption this year, and he was determined that he was going to do everything he could to prevent this Peshog from acting out against him. 
So he finished up at the house. He checked that everything was fine with the children and he headed out and he started walking down the one side of the glen, across the glen bottom and up the other side. And he knew it would take about an hour to get there. So he left in plenty of time. He knew the route that the funeral would take because there was a another Peshog that you don't take the most direct route to the church. You have to take a roundabout route, a circuitous route. And similarly, from the church to the graveside, you didn't take the direct line from the church door to the grave. You had to meander through the cemetery. A very powerful uh, superstition amongst rural Irish people in the 18th and 19th century. He knew that they wouldn't be doing that because they lived on a long straight glen and they'd have to drive the cart down the glen. And when they got to the bottom, they would take a right turn and head for the chapel in Cushendall. He knew also when the cart arrived at the house with two horses, that before the coffin was brought out, that the horse and cart would be turned around three times in the road. And this was also considered a, a lucky thing to do at a funeral. And it was a way of uh, keeping further deaths from the door. But all he cared about was getting in before they turned the tables. And he made it just in time. As he came up to the door, there was a large crowd of people had gathered in the yard and the parish priest was just coming out of the house. His purple stole symbolizing penance and sorrow round his neck and no fancy ecumenical utensils, a bucket of water that he'd called for and he'd blessed. And into that he dipped a whitewash brush and he lifted it up and he scattered drops of the now holy water over the heads of the people gathered there. And at this, Joseph burst into the house, pushed his way through the crowd that were gathered there, put his hand on the table and vaulted himself onto the top of the table. Now there was a crowd of young male relatives gathered in a circle around the table, waiting for the moment when the corpse would be lifted off it so that they could quickly turn the tables because the Peshog demanded that it be done before the deceased person was taken from the house. Because after they'd gone through the, the door, the Peshog had, would lose all its force. So it was a matter of urgency to do this. And it was done up and down the country. There's so many different accounts of it happening in different counties of Ireland in precisely the same way. But there he is standing on top of the table. He put his two fists up in front of him and he said, there will be no tables turned here today. Now, the young men gathered around the table. They sort of stiffened back their shoulders and they looked at him and they weighed up the odds that they could overpower him. But he was a strong man and they thought the better of it and they stood back and they faded back and they formed a column to put the coffin on their shoulders and carry it feet first out of the house. He stayed there for several minutes, his eyes wild, his nostrils flaring and he looked around the room. The clock on the wall had been stopped at the moment that his brother-in-law had passed which seems like a, a respectful thing to do, but the reality was, if you had several hundred people visiting your house for a week, have you any idea how many times somebody says to you, well, what time did he die? Stop the clock and you don't have to answer that question. People just looked at the clock and they said, oh, I see he died at a quarter past three or whatever the time was. On the far wall, there was what he knew was a mirror and there was two pictures, but you couldn't see them because black cloth had been draped over both pictures. It was very important to cover up mirrors because there was a Peshog that said, if the, the bereaved were walking past a mirror and they glanced at themselves, that they could also potentially see the spirit of the deceased person who had yet left 
the house. So it was very important to cover up the mirrors and to cover up pictures, partly because of reflection. But of course, the practical thing was that it was very traumatic to see photographs of your dear ones when you knew the situation that you were in and that you were preparing for their funeral. Joseph also knew the means by which they would have prepared his brother-in-law for burial. Some accounts have it that, that the corpse would be placed in a kitchen chair, sitting upright on a white sheet, and that there, uh, local women who specialised in these things would come into the house and they would help to wash the person, to shave the person if they were male, the razor for which would be disposed of immediately after the funeral. It couldn't be used again once it had shaved a corpse. He also knew that during the wake, two nights of wake, that the people would have had a fairly hefty shopping bill to settle because you had to bring in enough to give refreshments to everybody who visited, basics, bread, butter, jam, tea. But also, it was unheard of to have a wake where every male that entered the building was reached a clay pipe. I've seen a, a, a funeral bill from 1914, as late as that, and on the bill, the funeral, by the way, the whole cost of the funeral, including the coffin, was 13 pounds, six shillings and ninepence. And the coffin cost five pounds. But on the bottom of the bill, a gross of clay pipes, 144 clay pipes and two and a half pounds of tobacco. Because it was a custom, it was a tradition that they did. Every single man was reached a pipe. And before he would take a puff, of the pipe, he had to say, God have mercy on his soul, or God have mercy on her soul. And they would puff away at their pipes there all evening. And there was a male relative in the corner at a table with tobacco and a box of brand new clay pipes. And his job was to, to cut the tobacco and fill the pipes and make sure that nobody was without a pipe. Now, women didn't traditionally smoke pipes, but for them, the shopping bill also included snuff and there would have been saucers of snuff throughout the house. Now, Joseph was a rational, intelligent person, but when it came to funerals and wakes, he was as superstitious as any person in the Glen, and he went along with just about everything that happened, turning the horse in the road, the way that the body was prepared, the turning of the tables, he understood. But where he drew the line was at wake games, which was a very common thing in an Irish wake. They played numerous games, but the most common and popular game was called slapping. And what that involved was each man, they would form a circle of men in the kitchen and each man would place his right hand palm out on the lower back, his own lower back. And then in the circle using their free hand, they had to slap as hard as they could the open palm of the man to their left. And this went on right round the circle. And it, it was a strength test. It was a test of, of endurance. And eventually, over the course of maybe an hour of this very physical game, men dropped out, men surrendered. Perhaps old men had had their day at it and they couldn't do it anymore. But eventually it would not narrow down to just two men remaining. And there are accounts of, Joseph had heard them, there are accounts of men suffering over 200 blows to the palm of their hand and both men being so stubborn that they would not surrender and the, the contest continuing until blood was drawn from their fingertips. Now, the church was very against this because you can imagine there was a certain amount of what we here would call the crater, which is pochin. Uh, there was a certain amount of drink taken. And also, slapping was a game that was used to settle scores in a community. So two fellas who didn't like each other very much, they looked forward to a wake because it was an opportunity to go in 
and to perform really forceful horseplay against a person you didn't like. Or groups of people could gang up on a very unpopular person and they could make their evening awful. And the priest, in most parishes in Ireland by the 1860s, the priest had outlawed slapping. It became so violent it often spilled over into fist fights. But the young men tended to ignore it. And it got to be that widows had to announce there'd be no slapping at this wake. This wake will be slapping free. And young men were so, uh, they took umbrage at this so much that they would refuse to attend the funeral the following day. The custom died out around the, the beginning of the 20th century. So there he is. He's on the table. His fists are up. He's taken part in just about everything that he had to, but he's not having the tables turned. At the head of the coffin, when she's placed in, there's a woman with a shawl over her head. And at the foot of the coffin, there's a woman with a shawl over her head. And they begin to keen. They keen. They cried. They wailed. They pulled their hair. They were not relatives of the man in the coffin. They were professional keeners. They were people with a reputation for being very good at keening, performing this lament over the, and it was a very ritualized lament where you would have to, in speech, you would have to describe their genealogy and what good stock they came from and the good deeds that they'd done in their life and how they would be missed by their bereaved relatives. And then this crying and wailing would go on. And of course, it was to encourage other people to have an, an open display of grief. Keening doesn't really happen these days. And, and by most accounts, it had died out certainly as a paid, as a paid activity. It had paid out. It, it, it had played out by the turn of the 19th into the 20th century. But I read accounts of keening women, and one account said uh, they tended to be brought whiskey about every half hour. And funny enough, the more whiskey that was brought to them, the more horrifically they cried. And I would imagine that that was the case. Now, Joseph was satisfied The Peshog had been held off. He climbed down from the table and he went outside. And as he walked through the crowd of people in the yard, he was aware that every eye was on him. They were looking at him like he deprived them of the most precious blessing that they could get. He was not a popular man that day, but he didn't care. He had safety. For his family and that's all he cared about for a wee while because one of his children was taken by a fever the following year and his mother passed away peacefully shortly after because being alive in rural ireland in poverty was a dangerous thing in the 19th century life expectancy for men and women was below 50 years of age so although we think of the elderly in Irish communities, elderly meant 50 and above. Very few people attained great age because of illness, consumption, dysentery, hunger. It's no wonder that people had so many pushogs to protect them from death because every day survived must have felt like a miracle. Today, we don't have many of these Peshogs in our funerals, but we have some. It's still lucky to have rain falling on a coffin in procession. The corpse is still carried out of the house feet first. And in some houses, and I've been at a wake where this happened, the mirrors and the pictures are still covered up in black drapes. But thankfully, nobody's had to wear the clothes of the deceased for three successive Sundays at Mass, and nobody has had to stand on a table to prevent the tables from being turned. Oh, thank you, Stephen. Thank you. You're welcome. Stephen is a stalwart of our Glen Storytelling Cultural Heritage Group, as is um, uh, Colin Irwin, 
as is Karen, as is Janice Witherspoon, whom you'll hear in a, a wee minute. But before Janice, I'd like to call on our third featured guest who we'd wanted to bring this year uh, over to Scotland. Uh, Dougie Mackay, are you there? I'm hoping so. I am indeed. Oh, great. So, um, yeah, thank you, Liz. I'm just going to shuffle it onto gallery view so I can actually see everyone because that feels a nicer way to tell. So thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Liz, for inviting us and everyone that's told or played tonight. Um, and yeah, I, I guess as I was thinking of hearing that last story, there's something yeah, important about acknowledging the grief. And as well as that, it made me think of a woman called Joanna Macy. Some of you might have heard of. She's a Buddhist activist that does amazing work. And she says the, the keys to change are grief and gratitude and having both. So I thought seeing as we've just had a story about grief, maybe we could, it made me think of the things that I've been grateful for through this lockdown. There's been lots of tough things. It's been difficult not seeing folk. Um, but what has been present for me anyway in the place I live are spots in nature. So the woods that I can walk each day, the mountain at the back of my house. And just two nights ago, I, was, I, I think I'd kind of forgotten it was right there. And I went to the loch and saw it under the almost full moon and just 10 minutes by the loch, with the moon up above and the wind blowing and the, the moon shining in the, in the waves, it was such a special, it's a tonic. It's almost like, I don't know if that qualifies as a pishog, but it's definitely something that's helped me get through. So I wonder just before I start this story or as I start, if maybe you've got a place, maybe a nature place. I'm thinking of water, I'm thinking of lochs, lakes, rivers, coasts, maybe there's a special place you've got that you might want to type in the chat. And we can get a little collective of all these nature places that we're grateful for. And um, yeah, we'll have some images from all of you that can maybe feed into the story. And if you're not too distracted typing, hopefully you're ready for this story. Are people ready? Very good. A long time ago, in the far, far northwest of the American continent, there was a woman. And that woman lived in a hut on the edge of the forest. And this woman, she dreamed of crystal clear waters. She didn't dream of the rolling waters of the sea. She didn't dream of the flowing waters of the river. She dreamed and she yearned for a crystal clear lake. A lake so still that as a child, when she played in its waters, when she looked down, she could see her own face, her own reflection in it, and always she'd be smiling. Always she'd be playing with her, with her family, and there was always a smile on her face. Now she dreamed of those times because times now were not so happy for her. There was seldom a smile in that little hut on the edge of the wood, gracing her face. She was married to a hunter. And this hunter, well, he wasn't a great, sort to be stuck in a hut on the edge of the wood with. Let's put it that way. The story says he was ugly, and not just as ugly as anyone that we may have met in the real world, even uglier, even more hunched, longer nose, and he only had one eye. And the eye that had been taken out at some point and spent all day and all night weeping yellow pus. But she wasn't shallow. It wasn't just that he was ugly, that he was unpleasant to look at that made her downhearted. He had a bitter heart. He never said a kind word. In fact, even if she had seen it, even if he had said a mean word, she might have been grateful for what he said was nothing. And it was said to be the secrecy that drove her nuts. For every day after he'd been hunting, he would come back, he would lay the game on the table and she would say, did anything happen in the woods today? How did you spend your day? And he would just grunt in her direction, point at the game, cook. And he would sit down the fire and, um, and he would scowl at the flames and the, and the, at the licking flames. And she'd prepare the food. They would eat the food in silence, 
not so much as a word of gratitude, they would go to bed in silence. And by the, every morning, by the time she would awake, he would be gone. And this is how they spent their days. Day after day, the days turned into weeks, the weeks turned into months. After years of this, finally she had had enough. She awoke with the birds at the dawn. And she crept out of her bed, she put on her clothes, she went out the door. And he was out of sight, but anyone worth their salt in these days knew how to track. She could see his footprints pressed in the clay soil. She could see, she could hear the birds up ahead alarming a human walking past. And she followed the trail following her, her husband, the hunter. And when she got closer, because she was running, when she got closer, she heard this strange sound, this lilting sound carrying through the forest that she'd never heard in all her days. It was no bird. It was no animal she knew of. And when she got closer, she thought, that sounds like my, my husband's voice, but in a manner she'd never heard of. When he came into view, she saw him and thought, is he skipping? And true enough, up on the track ahead, he was skipping as gay as any child you might have met. And when the woods opened out into a great meadow filled with flowers, he spun, he pir pirouetted like the most graceful ballet dancer. And he belted out a song, a song that was said to be so beautiful it would make even the stoniest heart weep. And he sang and he spun and he danced and she sat staring entranced. And as he sang and he spun and he danced, he changed. His form shuddered and shifted, his face changed. And no longer was he just an ugly secretive hunter. He became an even uglier secretive hunter. His twice as much pus came spurting out of his eye, his back became twice as bent and crooked, his nose twice as long, his teeth broken, and the smell that came from that meadow, it was horrendous. And that was it. She made a choice, she turned and she ran. And she ran deeper into the forest. She ran, she ran, she ran. And with every, every footstep she made, her heart felt lighter. With every footstep, she felt joy. With every footstep, she felt like singing herself. She was so overcome with joy that she didn't notice a great thundering of footsteps up ahead. She was so carried away with her own joy, she didn't notice a great shadow cast over the sun. She was so overcome with her own joy, she didn't notice the great greasy fingers of the ogre lots of ogres tonight, until they wrapped around her. And we already know from Kate's story where people go after they end up in the ogre's hand. In a sack. I'll eat you later. And he got, she got thrown on his back. The sack smelt of sweat and death and blood. And she was bumping around. And, well, the ogre didn't want her to sing. Every time she made so much a noise, he would elbow and say, shut up. And he carried her through the forest she bumping around on his back and he took her to a great tent, threw her from the sack inside and pinned it down, nailed down the, the, the flaps of the tent. I'll be back for you later. For one woman, it's barely a snack for an ogre. He was off to find more. And she sat in this dark tent and she wept. And she wept and she wept. She thought, this isn't how the stories go. I followed my heart. I can't get eaten by an ogre. This isn't fair. This isn't meant to happen. And she sat there weeping and weeping and weeping. And when she finally had no tears left, she sat there in silence, in the darkness, and she heard a whispering. Look up. Become raven. And she looked up and there. Through the darkness, she could just see it shimmering, the faintest silver, but as she reached up and felt the feathers, she was able to pull down the raven cloak. Excited, she pulled it on and she put her hands in the wings and tried to get the beak over her head, but it was just that little bit too tight. It would never fit her. She could try to squeeze into it for a hundred years and never would that raven cape fit her. And she thought, if I can't even trust a wee small voice, who can I trust? But as she laid it on the ground, she saw something glowing, like an ember in the hearth. And as she walked over towards that and reached towards it, it was soft as silk, a fox's pelt. 
And she pulled it on. She didn't even need to try. It slipped on over her arms, over her back. Great bushy tail behind her that she enjoyed swinging about a bit. And as soon as that, as soon as the fox's pelt was on, her senses sharpened. A breeze, the faintest of breeze coming from one side of the tent and she was down on her belly and she was digging. She was digging belly in earth, face in the ground and as she dug and dug, getting her nails right into the soil, that gap underneath the tent grew. And she got it so big she was able to squeeze her way out and her foxy senses delighted in the aromas of the forest. The pine was overwhelming. The moon was high in the sky. Her eyes took a moment to sharpen to the night, and once they'd sharpened, she ran. And where did she go? Text it in the box if you think you know. <laughs> We're not finished. I can see someone clapping. <laughs> that was just an unorthodox pause in the middle of the story. She ran and she ran and she ran. And where did she go? But she carried on running until she came to that same lake. The lake she'd yearned for, the lake, she, the lake she'd dreamed of every day in this miserable hut. And when she got to the lake, the sun was high in the sky and it shimmered just as she had when she was a child. There was a fisherman on the boat. And while she'd been running a long time, she was thirsty. She went to drink at the edge of the lake. It's crystal clear waters, just as cool and fresh as she remembered them as a child. But as she looked and saw her reflection, she didn't see her face smiling. She didn't see the reflection of a woman in a fox's pelt. She saw the reflection of a fox. Fox's muzzle, fox's pointed ears, fox's bushy tail, just with the green eyes of a woman. And as she looked at these, as she stared at her own reflection in the, in the lake, the fisherman, her father on the lake, stared at her likewise. And he dropped down in his boat. He slowly paddled, his, his paddles barely breaking the water as he crept his way towards the shore. He took out his net. He took out a fish. And he held that fish in front of the fox, knowing that a fox pelt would be valuable. Fox meat would be valuable. And she, he held out the fish. And he looked at her. He, she looked at him, her own father, and tried as much as she could to show through her eyes, it is me, your daughter, do you not recognize me? But how could a fisherman recognize his daughter as a fox? He held out the fish. She came forward, and as she leapt forward for the fish, he swung his neck and she ducked out the way. But he came again with the fish. Fish, leap, net, duck. Fish, leap, net, duck. And this dance, the two spiraling around the fisherman father and the daughter in the shape of a fox went on for hours. Until, eventually, for a reason that I don't quite know, the father laid down the fish and he pulled his canoe onto the shore and she satisfied her hunger on that fish. And with her hunger sated, she wondered where she could go. Night was falling, evening was falling, the sun sinking in the west and she thought, as many of us would, when things get that strange, the only place to go is home. She thought, maybe if I get back to my tent, the tent where I grew up, maybe everything will be okay. Maybe whatever strange enchantment that's come over me will be broken. And she turned and she ran. She ducked and she dived through the, the legs and the grasping arms of the people in the village. And she got closer to that tent where she'd grown up. She could see her mother's hands tending the fire. She could smell the pine needle tea wafting out and she picked up her pace and she leapt and she bounded and she leapt towards that tent where she had grown up. And the tent shifted round, thwack, she hit her face off the wooden door and her, her red blood dropped in the snow. She shook herself to her senses. She leapt again, thwack, leapt again, thwack. Every time she leapt, four times she tried to get home and each time the tent turned and she was met with the wooden exterior. People were gathering, they were causing a fuss. And there always comes a time where you've got to just cut your losses. And this was her moment. She turned, she ran again. She ran between people's legs, she ran beyond clasping hands and she ran out into the forest again. And she ran and she ran and she ran until her lungs were rasping and she was panting for breath and parched with thirst, but it said she carried on running. 
And for those that can see truly, that can notice these types of things, they say that those that could see her when her front paw would land on the earth, a star would sparkle in the sky up above, a new star. And when her back foot landed on the earth, a new green shoot would sprout where she'd walked. And it's said that that fox still runs the face of the earth to this day. And as long as she is running, the stars will shine above and abundance will come to the earth. And who knows, if you go out to a nature place, maybe you'll see that fox running. I hope that maybe you do. Oh. That's the end of that story. Thank you so much, Jiggy. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, and I'd forgotten to say that Kate's going to be guesting at um, one of our yarn spinning events on the 8th of October at 3 p.m. And Doogie's going to be a guest on the 14th of October. So those are free afternoons of storytelling. American people have to get up a bit earlier. So, uh, and it's the middle of the night for our Australian and New Zealand friends. But anyway, that, those are going to be on. Thank you, Doogie. Those three storytellers, Doogie and Maria and Kate, all being well will be with us next year. But now we go to our local storytellers again. Janice Witherspoon has been waiting very patiently. And Janice, it's late on at night, but people, there's still 89 people listening. So hey, you have a very good audience here, more than we normally have, even on a Saturday night. So Janice, are you there with the story, please? Janice lives in Gun Arm. Hello, everyone. Yes, I'm here. So there's definitely no ogres in this story, but there is a bit of fish and a bushy tail might make an appearance at some point. This is a wee story about a chap called Davy. Now Davy didn't like fish. He didn't like the smell of it. He didn't like the taste of it. And he didn't like the way their cold eyes gleamed. But he lived in a wee fishing village on the Antrim coast. And the only job he could get was as a fisherman out on one of the boats. Well, it was his job that when the fish came over the side of the boat, he had to cut first the heads and then the tails off the fish and chuck them into the ice bucket. Well, as you can imagine, he did not like that job one bit, but it was all he had. Now, one day when he was out in the fishing boat, a fish landed over the side of the boat and it came onto his table. And for the first time in his life, Davy thought that this well, it was the most beautiful fish he'd ever seen. Its eyes didn't look cold, they looked a bit warm, and its fins had all the colours of the rainbow. And he hadn't the heart to kill it. So when he thought the owner of the boat wasn't looking, he took the fish and he chucked it back into the water and it swam away free. But when the boat got back to shore that day, the owner of the boat had seen and he called Davy all the names of the day and told him that that was it and he never wanted to see him on his boat again. Davy had lost his job. So he was walking up the village street wondering how on earth he was going to tell his wife about this and what the family would do. And you know the way sometimes you get the feeling that there's someone just behind you? Well, Davy had that feeling and he had a wee juke over his shoulder and, well, I don't know how he knew. Maybe it was the horn sticking out of his head or the hooves sticking out the bottom of his trousers or the tail at the back of his jacket. But Davy knew that it was the devil. And the devil came walking alongside him and spoke to him. Hello, Davy. Having a hard time recently, I think. Mm, said Davy. Well, you could say that. Well, said the devil, I've got a proposition for you. I've got a cow. And this cow will give you the purest, creamiest milk you've ever tasted. And as much of it as you need. And I'll give you this cow for three years. And at the end of three years, I'll come back and I'll ask you three questions. And if you can answer those questions well and good. And if you can't, well, you're coming back down to hell with me. Well, Davy thought about this for a moment or two. And you know, 
He'd never been quite sure which direction he was headed in anyway. So he thought he might as well give it a go. So he agreed and the next moment there was a puff of smoke, the devil disappeared and in its place there was a cow, a beautiful brown Jersey cow with big brown eyes. And Davy took it home and it softened the blow of him losing his job. Now for once in his life, the devil had told the truth. That cow gave the best milk you could imagine and there was so much of it that they were able to make butter and cheese and yogurt and all the things that you can make with milk. And there was so much they were able to sell some. And with the money they bought a few geese and a goat and expanded a little. And then they decided to go to the main street and open a wee cafe. And they were doing well. But all this took time. And of course, time was the one thing that Davy was running out of. But when the three years were starting to come to an end, he thought, well, maybe the devil will have forgotten about me. Hmm, probably not. Well, maybe there'll be easy questions. Or maybe not. So Davy began to read the encyclopedia. This was in the days before the internet. Well, he worked his way through the A's. And after the A's, he went on to the B's. But he hadn't even got to the C's when one evening he was in his wee cafe. There was one customer sitting at a table and he was waiting for her to finish her cup of tea. When there was a flash of lightning and a crash of thunder and in strode the devil. Now he had dressed up specially for the occasion. He had polished and shone his horns till they were glinting. His tail was swinging away at the back of his coat and he was stabbing the air with his big trident. In he walks. Well, dearie, are you ready for my three questions? <laughs> dearie stammered and he tried to sink into a hole in the floor, but then he realized where it might go and he stood up straight again. But before he could say a word, the woman, finishing her cup of tea in the corner, she came over and she said, yes, he is ready for your questions, but that's your first one gone, you've only two left. Well, the devil looked at this woman and he looked at David and he said, will you tell her to butt out of our conversation? No. I will not butt out, said the woman, and that's your second question, so you've only one left. Well, the devil was getting furious, and he took to the turn to the woman and he said, and who the blazes are you anyway? And I, she said, am the queen of the fish kingdom, and three years ago to this day, Davy saved my life. So, take your cow. It's out the back. That's your three questions done. And leave Davy in peace. Well, the devil was so furious at being outwitted, especially by a woman, that he strode out of that cafe and he forgot to take his cow with him. And from that day on, Davy's wee cafe prospered like never before. And people went to that cafe and as well as a cup of tea and a cup of coffee, you often got a good story in it. And that's my story. Lovely, Janice, thank you so much. That was lovely. Now Janice and Stephen and Colin and Kieran and me are going to be doing a concert tomorrow night at eight o'clock. We've pre-recorded it. I want you to watch it if you can because the, the final song is worth seeing because it will remind us of the times we're living in. I'm saying no more about that. We had such fun doing it at the beautiful Hillmount House. Um, I intend to call a couple more people. If you're still in with me, there's still 85 people there. This is fantastic. Um, another greeting from across the world. Uh, Hilary Spangler, are you over there on the far side of the Atlantic? Will you say hello to us, maybe? Hi, Janice. My um, cat tried to give you some harp uh, background music to that story, which was fun. Um, oh, that's me. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm very excited that there was a shout out to Joanna Macy. It's actually really interesting. Um, I took a workshop from Joanna 
in 2017 and it was a community song leading workshop and it just like changed my perception of how music is shared um, and it goes so well with like what Liz does every week and through this festival as well so I'm excited um, to do that. Uh, I'm also going to go to gallery view. But the song I'm going to sing is called Pretty Saro. It is an Appalachian ballad and I've been recently looking into a lot of like ballad singing and what I found is that not all of them but a lot of Appalachian ballads are sung and written stories through music from the perspective of men and while that is great um, I'm hoping to try to figure out ways to be able to let myself like when you see yourself in music that's what makes you want to keep it going and to share it is when you can see yourself and so the more that we can start to see ourselves into the songs that have been around for so many years the better so this is I don't see myself in this song but that's okay um there we go <laughs> When I first come to this country in 1849, I saw many fell lovers, but I never saw mine. Have you it all around me? saw that I was quite alone and me a poor stranger and a long way from home well my true love she won't have me and it's this I understand for she wants some freeholder and I have no land I couldn't maintain her on silver and gold but all the other fine things that my love's house could hold fairly well to oh mother fairly well to my father too for i'm going on to ramble this wide world all through and when I get weary, I'll sit down and cry and think of my Sarah, pretty Sarah, my bride. Well, I wished I was a turtle dove had wings and could fly far away to my lover's lodgings tonight i draw nigh and there in her arms i lay there all night watch through the windows for the dawning of life. That's a song. Oh, thank you, Hilary. We hope we'll see you back in the glens before too long. We hope so. Thank you. Well, now we're going to have one more story and then maybe Colin will finish up with a, a song from part of this beautiful part of the world. But uh, I'm going to go down to Cork, to Maria Gillen, who's been a stalwart supporting this festival. Uh, so Maria, are you there? I am here, Carleen. <laughs> and lovely it is to see you, and brilliant it is to be around the virtual Ballyaben Barn table. 
again, you know, and I can't wait to be belly to belly, heart to heart, gut to gut, as everybody was saying tonight. So this is a short one. Tonight is the night of the full moon. And tomorrow we're into October. There we go. Can you hear me now? <laughs> I was getting worried there, Maria. I thought the devil had got you. I was chatting away. And this is, this is a story a little bit uh, about that. Lovely to be here, Liz. What a great night. I really enjoyed it. And to be sitting around the Ballyamon Barn table again is fantastic, you know. So tonight is the night of the full moon. When you finish here, go out through your front door and look up in the sky. And it's the night when the veil thins because we're coming into October now. And we had such threads of that today. We had the Manaw Fasa, the women of the knowledge. We had the Pishoiga, the little traditions of Ireland. And this story is about a Pishoga of the Ban Fasa of Shandu, which is the wise woman of Shandon. So they would say, when you go to a dance, be careful. For there are three types of creature that stalk this earth have no business being here. They are the she and the things of the hedges. And they have been, their time has been, so they're here now in the hedges and the growths of era. There are the ghosts of the people who have died and don't know that they are dead. And finally, they are the angels that were hurled out of heaven after Satan on that night long, long ago. How would you know then? How would you know if you were in the presence of one of those creatures? And they'd look at their feet. And if both feet were even this much off the ground, you would know that you were in the presence of one of these creatures. For they are forbidden by the laws of God to walk the earth. So this old story is about going to the dance, the Cayley, on the full moon night when the veil thins. Look at the feet. And if you see a cloven hoof where the trainer should be, <sighs> run to a nice warm session like this so i'm keeping it short tonight liz thanks very much lovely Thank to you, see Maria. you that's been a, a wonderful uh, pleasure to have you with us and your greeting was lovely and there's lots of people on who sent us beautiful greetings i'm just taking it easy tonight and not telling a story i'm going to post a couple of mine i posted one this morning for national poetry day and i'll post another one tomorrow but we're going to end up maybe with um colin singing one of his own songs but before we do one to Obviously, we're very grateful for any donations via the website, which is www.goastories.org, because we really, really want you um, to continue this festival. Two, I think it's really important to, that you are with us all weekend. Now, you don't have to always be right there at the time, because we hope these sessions will be on a bit longer. But tomorrow night's a nice one from Hillmount House, uh, a lovely concert, which we very much enjoyed. Um, Saturday, we're going live stream at three o'clock in the afternoon from the Accidental Theatre in Belfast, thanks to the Causeway Coast and Glens Heritage Trust, which I mentioned at the beginning. So grateful for their support this year. And then um, Saturday night, I'll host my own session. If any of you people who are on who don't normally come uh, to my Saturday night Valley Yemen session, I'll put up my, uh, my, uh, my email you see why I'm not telling stories, I'm too tired. I uh, put up my email in the chat and you're very welcome to join us if you just get in touch with me. And then Sunday, we're gonna do two beautiful sessions at three and eight, filmed around the Antrim uh, coast from Fairhead right the way around to Glenarm. And it should be very beautiful. We've seen the film, so we, we recommend it. Even self praise is no recommendation, but totally I recommend it. So we're going to head to Glenarm to Colin to finish up with the story. And Jamie's put my email up because I'm probably incapable of typing it. Thanks, Colin. Thanks very much, Liz. I'm going to finish up with a song. I'm going to sing a song uh, about uh, it's set in a place, probably one of my, my 
most favourite places around this coast. I'm sure many of you who have been here and stayed with Liz in the barn and so on have uh, been taken up to White Park Bay. It's just breathtaking. And I've been lucky enough many times to be on it on a moonlit night. And it must be one of the most romantic places uh, anywhere. Uh, I, wish I, was, I wish I was there doing this live from there tonight. But anyway, I'm in my kitchen. It's called White Park Bay. And uh, it's, uh, as I said, it's our most romantic place. And this song is, is about romance, but it's about a romance that maybe just didn't work out uh, uh, the way, the, way the, the, the man in the, in the story would have liked it. White Park Bay. <laughs>
took some of the pain away My glimmer of hope all went up in smoke when I heard about your fiancé You play guitar, I play clown I didn't care if the whole damn world turned upside down Oh, to be young very much Colin that was lovely internet just about held out there it was going a bit dodgy for a while but I'm delighted to say we managed to hear that beautiful song and many of the people listening here have been on a tour of the coast with me or some of the friends and we always stop and look over at White Park Bay where the cows can be seen on the beach and many of the people have done the hike all the way around we're, there's still 70 odd people here with us. Thank you so much for hanging in with us for two full hours. I'd like to thank all the storytellers, our three guests, Kate and Doogie and Maria, who we hope we'll see with us next year. And also to our local tellers, to Janice, to Colin, to Stephen, to Kieran for his beautiful playing, to Karen there off in Oe Island, distance from us, and to Maria for her support. Hilary, of course, as well, Isabel, all the people that have sent greetings to us. Thanks very much. We'll see you over the rest of the weekend. And uh, thank you very much to our sponsors, Mid and East Antrim Borough Council, Cosy Coast and Glens Heritage Trust. And I can't name them without mentioning the project officer, Jimmy Laverty, without whom I couldn't have managed all this. And also the Honourable the Irish Society. Thanks very much indeed. And hope we'll see you over the weekend. Um, you can unmute yourselves and talk for a wee minute if you want to say something before you go or if anybody wants to the, the donkey cart and the cart into the you know oh, the... who's that now no, somebody's talking somebody somebody kind. definitely is talking uh, oh, really of... nothing to do with things. i'm not taking a direct route you took our sort of conversation i don't know who that is quite but oh, oh, is the donkey and cart yeah. is on the phone and then been given <laughs> Oh. I'm hitting everybody. Um, unmute yourself, Liz. Oh, yeah, I'll unmute myself as well. I think Jamie probably muted me. I'm going to blame him anyway. It's fantastic not if you're not having that control. Did you love that, Jimmy? I, you're like me, you're a control freak. Anybody want to say hello or send greetings? Now's your chance. Unless you're talking about Liz, a card. Yes, Maria. Can I, can I just say what a brilliant night. Thank you so much. Thank you for the whole of COVID because you've been there gathering us, giving us fantastic workshops, the Armstrong Trust, the work that is absolutely amazing and has been a soul road. It has been an important thing. And this, this is like the little cherry on top of the cake. Thank you. And we will be back next year because, you know, it's so important to support next year when everything is lifted. So, mwah. thank you, Liz. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed. Thank Can you. I just echo what Maria said there? Liz was fantastic. We knew you'd always be. Thanks, Madeline. You're very kind. Thank you. Yeah, probably will. There's Tyler as well. Who's that? Hello, Jimmy. Hello, Liz. All the storytellers and the musicians tonight, everybody all around the world. But thank you especially, Liz. Without Liz's hard work, none of this would happen. She does stuff throughout all the year. She's been trying to support everybody she can through lockdown and give everybody a wee lift. And it's been amazing. And the work that she's put in is unreal. And somebody's just written the story woman. Correct. 
Um, that's the title of my memoir. Thank you for promoting it. Donald, you. want to say something? Liz, yeah. Yes, Liz. Uh, first of all, thanks for the invitation at a, a, at a last minute, and I've just joined it. It's been fabulous, absolutely fabulous. I've had very great difficulty with the accents, and that's only from the people from the <laughs> North Antrim. <laughs> <laughs> and it's that's lovely that's to hear. boy. It's lovely to hear people from around the world. And sometime I'd love to join your festival and come and tell a story. Uh, I don't know any, but I can always make them up. It's always, uh, don't let the truth get in the way, of course. Uh, brilliant, brilliant night. I just, wanted to, I just wanted to let you know that actually I am the devil tonight. And I'm well pleased that you're keeping my memory alive. But I do have to go now because I have to get to a crossroads down in Georgia. So thanks very much for, for just for this tonight. It's been brilliant. Thank you very much. much. Thank you very much. And Caroline's still with us in New South Wales. She should have been here during the summer, shouldn't you, Caroline? I should have been, but next year um, I'm there. As soon as the planes are running, I'm coming. <laughs> and there's, there's our, our experienced barnminder, Dick, is there as well, and Veronica's here as well. Um, some of my experienced barnminders are all with us. Great evening, Liz. Thank, good luck for the rest of the weekend. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks very much indeed. Dishwasher tablets or dishwashing soap? Oh, dishwasher tablets. I don't know what that's all about. But anyway, there you go. There's dishwasher tablets coming in here as well. Anyway, I'm going to say good night before things get out of hand and we start talking about uh, garments or something. Listen, thank you yeah, very much. I'm going to stop the recording. Actually, you can.